Testing, one, two, and three. Sorry if I blew out your eardrums there a little bit. Make a quick change on our road mic. I feel like that's pretty solid. All right, so I got my uh, live stream here next to me. So if you do have some questions, please let me know. This is something kind of new for us. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take those off. Uh, so live streaming from home. Um, wanna talk a little bit about birding today because one of the things that we can do is get out and photograph birds. We're allowed to go outside here in the state of Ohio. So uh, if you are joining us live and you are joining us from uh, YouTube, sorry, I'm listening to my phone. I hear it in the background. Uh, if you are uh, tuning in live, please put in the comments where you're from. We wanna know uh, who all seeing this content, put your name in there. Um, I have it next to me on my left. so. I will uh, be able to see those questions. So if you do have any questions, let me know. Also, just let me know where you're from. I want to make sure that this live stream is getting out there. I'm at home alone with the dogs and my wife. And I guess that's not alone, I guess. Uh, but I'm just hanging out at home. I don't have anybody checking the stream or giving me cues or holding up any note cards or anything like that. So I'm relying on you. I'm relying on you to let me know. I will keep an eye on the um, chat. It's behind me on a computer. So just let me know in the comments um, or in the messages for this video. So let's see if anybody is. Looks like we have three people joining us. Uh, so it's up to you guys. I need you to let me know that you can hear me, that it's sounding okay. Um, this is kind of our premiere uh, stream, live stream from home. Um, so, you know, if there's things that we need to update or change, uh, please let me know. Happy to do that. I want to make sure that if we're providing content the, to you guys, it is the of the utmost quality. Um, anyone out there? Let me just check one thing. Perfect. I feel alone. There's people in the chat room, but they're not chatting with me. I'm, I have like a fear of missing out. What are they doing that I am not doing that I can't interact with them? I want to know. Interact in the chat. Eeyore says, audio sounds good. So I appreciate that. At least I know somebody's watching. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do things because we are about four minutes out. Uh, number one, I have a big German shepherd who likes to uh, bark at things out of the window. Uh, she's very protective, so I'm going to apologize for that. Um, I have two puppies downstairs, uh, so if you hear smaller barks, those are those. Um, and then my wife is downstairs, so if you hear somebody screaming at said puppies or German shepherd to be quiet, yeah, that's my wife. She is studying for med school and she's in the crunch time. So she's super focused on uh, school and stuff like that. So if you hear any of those outside sounds, it's because we are working from home. Also, while we are waiting a couple minutes out, I want to know what, what do you guys need? What do you want? What do you want us to teach you here at the Pixel Connection? Uh, you know, we're working in shifts. We are still open for curbside pickup. Uh, so we are been, by the state of Ohio, we have been deemed an essential business because we supply essential businesses like the media, police, things like that. They still need only. So there's nobody shopping in the store. Uh, but if you order online, you can do curbside pickup. If you give us a call, um, just let us know. How can we help? Um, and like I said, what content do you have? What What would you like to learn about? Uh, tomorrow we're doing, I believe it's five things to photograph in your home. So that'll be fun, photo and video in your home. Uh, we are doing on um, Friday, we're going to do the news. So every day my plan is to live stream at noon, kind of a lunch and learn. Uh, so you can get this little bit of um, information, this little bit 
of education, something that hopefully you can find inspiration in, uh, instead of sitting at home and watching, you know, Governor DeWine update and doom and gloom. You know, we want to inspire you guys. Photography is so important to all of us, and we know it's important to you. So that's why we kind of put these things together. So I'm going to take a look at the chat, see what we got. Still just Eeyore. Is anybody out there? We got five people in there. So you right, you that's being quiet in the back. I want you to put a message in the uh, live chat, especially if you are viewing this on um, YouTube. It's super easy. Um, just in the live chat, let us know that you are here. So we're about two minutes out. I'm going through all of my birding knowledge that was uh, given to me by my friend Eeyore. He got me up to speed uh, on birding. Um, it's been a long time since I've done any birding, um, but I have a ton of awesome information for you guys. But I did want to give a shout out to Mr. Eeyore, the king of reviews at the Pixel Connection, the king of content, uh, putting out awesome, informative blog posts over at pixelconnection.com. Just click on that blog tab and you'll be able to find a ton of information, including Spoiler alert, at the end of this presentation, I'm going to give a link to uh, the birding post where a lot of this information resides. So um, if this is a too long, did not watch, and you just want to fast forward uh, to just the content, you can go to our blog and you can see uh, the blog all about birding. Also, if you want a copy of today's presentation, feel free to email sales at thepixelconnection.com and we'll get that shipped over to you. I'm happy to share a link to the presentation uh, if there's any tips or anything that you need from that presentation. Let's see how many we got so far. Uh-oh, we lost a couple. We lost a couple. We're down to three. Oh, no. It's okay. It's going to take a minute to get the word out that we're doing this every day. Well, I'm going to do a quick Facebook post since I got a couple of moments. See if I can share out that I am going live. I am going live over at live.thepixelconnection.com. And we are talking about birding. Come watch. Boop, 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 live dot connection.com. Perfect. Okay, I posted that out there, so hopefully we will get some more friends. Oh my gosh, we're already up to eight. Tech Gear Talk is here. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, if you can, in the comments, go ahead and leave a message uh, where you're from, where you're joining us from. I uh, definitely want to see where this is reaching. Um, also, make sure that I'm still connected because I don't have any production assistance here. It's it's just me talking to a camera and talking with a presentation. So uh, I want to know that you guys are out there. I have a little computer here that we're actually streaming through that I'm able to see the comments and things like that. Um, please let us know. And if there's other things that you want to learn about, definitely, definitely, definitely put that in the comments below or shoot us a message. I mean, we're super available. Instagram at the dot pixel, the dot the connection, just search for the pixel connection. Um, Facebook, uh, through Facebook, you can send us a message. Tell what do you want to learn? Like, what are you needing to be inspired about? We want to know, we'll put content together for you. We have a staff that is passionate about photography, all different kinds of photography, whether that is film, whether that is birding, whether that is cars, nature, astro, landscape, product, food, weddings, portraits, pretty much everything. Uh, so if there's something that you want to learn a little bit more about, please let us know. Uh, let's see. Let's see where everybody is coming in from. I know that there is somebody from Avon, Ohio. That is Eeyore. He's working at the store today. Uh, Cleveland Heights, uh, hashtag 216. So more Ohio representing from Tech Gear Talk. And the other viewers that are on here, so it looks like there's uh, seven or eight other people. Uh, they might be viewing through the website. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And this presentation will be available um, on our YouTube channel after we complete everything today. So let's get started. So what are our goals for today? Uh, understand the length of lens that you need for bird photography. That's important. Lens selection. That's one of the questions that we get all the time. You know, what, what lens do I need to get this picture of a bird or this picture? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, what camera features are important? These are not settings. What features that are built into the camera, What of the, which of those are the most important? 
Uh, number two, uh, what are some of the most overlooked gear when it comes to birding? You get out there, you got your lens, you got your camera, it's all set up, ready to go, and then you press the button, you forgot something. We're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. We're gonna then jump into the actual settings of the camera. So I'm gonna go full screen here, so that way you guys can keep an eye on all. You can see all the information on the screen. Um, but what exposure settings should you set to get super sharp photos? What autofocus settings should your camera uh, be set to. And then finally, what are some tips and techniques to help you get some really great shots? So jumping right in with lens length. So a lot of people ask us, you know, how much zoom is required? And it's a hard question because it's one of those things where, yes, if you could, if you could afford it, if you could have the longest lens possible, you know, then that would be awesome. But honestly, that's not always the case. So recently I was working with a client and she had purchased a 200 millimeter and it was just a 200 millimeter prime and she took it out to try it out and she realized that it was just way too close it was for a panasonic camera so what is kind of the happy medium how much do you need when it comes to lens choice so about 400 um, millimeters or more is ideal and when we talk about these um ranges they're full frame so you know for example if it's micro four thirds then like that 200 millimeter um if it's a crop sensor you know you have to take your crop into consideration for that 1.5 or 1.6 times uh crop but around 400 and it doesn't have to be a 400 millimeter prime it just has to be something that kind of covers that range so one of our favorites is the 150 to 600 uh for the you could re actually rent that for the whole weekend and it'll only cost you 40 bucks so that's a great way to not have to spend a lot of money and try out a lens to see if you like it. And then, or if you're only gonna shoot birds every now and again, then just stop in and rent the lens. And then if you fall in love, you're finding yourself, you're using it all the time, then you can purchase it. But we don't, we don't like telling people just, you can't spend money to, you know, get better photos all the time. You know, just spending more money doesn't magically mean that you're gonna have um, the top notch photos. It takes practice, it takes time. It doesn't, it's not just something we can, you know, throw money at, if you will. So that's where renting is a really, really good option. It makes sure that it's the perfect fit for you. Uh, so, and that being said, you can also get great photos from like 200 to 300 millimeter, but you're just going to have to get a little bit closer. And we're going to talk a little bit about getting closer uh, towards the end of the presentation. But lens length around 400 or 400 more is ideal. But don't think because you have a 70 to 200 that that's not enough you know, that, that you can definitely still do birding. You don't have to go out and buy one of these pretty fancy uh, lenses that I have on the screen. So what are some of our faves? Uh, the 150 to 600, uh, it's 899. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal lens. Uh, Tamron also has a 150 to 600. Uh, it's a little sharper. Um, and what's really cool is it actually has an Arca Swiss tripod foot. So if you're already in the Arca Swiss, if that's what your tripods are, um, that is... A really useful thing and then also it has a zoom lock so you can actually lock it in a certain um, focal length so that way you don't have to worry about you know it zoom, you know creeping in or or i'm sorry creeping out um or you know falling out if you want to stay right at say you know 175 millimeters you can do that uh the sigma 60 to 600 is good it's just a little big it's a little heavy um but those zoom range from 60 to 600 it's phenomenal. So when you're looking at these lenses, and that's why I talk so much about rental, is you don't know, like, until you have, until you carry the 60 to 600 out into the woods with you, you know, or you carry five or six different lenses, you have to make that decision. You have to make the decision of, I would rather just carry the 60 to 600 and not have to worry about bringing out three lenses. Or you might say, hey, I want three different lenses because I might not always need the super long or I might need more of a medium telephoto. Uh, you have to make that decision. The Sony 200 to 600, uh, you know, finally we have a native long zoom for e-mount, uh, which is awesome. And then Fuji actually has the uh, 100 to 400 as well. And that is equivalent to like a 150 to 600. A couple honorable mentions, uh, one of my favorite lenses, uh, actually my two favorite lenses for micro four thirds are the 200 to eight uh, from Panasonic, the Olympus 300 F4, uh, which is, if you know Mike Amico, um, He's the local Olympus rep. He's using that lens all the time. He has some phenomenal bird photos. Um, the Nikon 200 to 500. So if you are a Nikon shooter, that's a great um, 
great lens. Olympus has a 75 to 300 and then the Tamron 18 to 400. So um, not a super long lens, but it's a great all-in-one lens and it tends to be a little bit more uh, inexpensive than some of the others on the list. So what do you, what features should we look for though? You know, what when we're looking at a camera, so uh, whether we're buying a new camera or we're wondering if our camera is a good fit, um, these are some of the things that we want to look for in a camera. So autofocus performance, you know, how many focus points do you have? Uh, what tracking modes are incorporated? Uh, those are the kind of things that you want to do some research on. And if you're, if you're like, what does that even mean? Why does the number of focus points even matter? Please reach out to us. We are more than happy to set up a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, another thing that we're actually doing right now is we're doing virtual one-on-ones. So, and these are no cost. If you have questions, um, you can just go ahead and reach out to us and we can do a one-on-one. -on -one. Or if you wanna do a full one-on-one -on -one class, we can actually do those virtually now. So um, it's the normal rate for our one-on-one -on -one class where you can jump on with one of us and do a kind of one-on-one -on -one and know, hey, this I have this question about my camera or I wanna spend an hour you know, just picking your brain on burden, we, we offer that as well. So that's something new uh, that we uh, put out there. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. All of our contact information will be on the last slide for you. So uh, another thing you want to look at is frame rate. So how many frames per second, you know, can that your camera shoot? A lot of times with birds in flight, you know, you're going to basically hold that shutter button down as it takes multiple photos and you want to make sure that your camera has enough frames per second in order to get, you know, many, many pictures of birds. You want, you know, you, this is where you, you often see that uh, frame rate advertised as one of the key things for camera, especially more, the higher end, like the A9, uh, the 1DX line. It's because it can do so many frames per second and capture that defining moment. So sensor. So this this is interesting. So if you know me, uh, you know that I worked for Panasonic for the last couple years. So we talked a lot about sensor size because with micro four thirds, people hear that micro and they think it's super, super tiny and it's not going to do a very good job. And that's quite the opposite in things like birding. So with full frame, uh, you'll do better at higher ISOs. With APS-C, the crop factor will give you kind of a longer focal length. Now, with micro four thirds, you're going to have lightweight and you're going to have that two times crop. So you could have a super, super, super lightweight setup. And especially if you're photographing the birds during the day, you know, having that super high performance in low light isn't as important as having something that's lightweight or that can do really, really long zooms at a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the weight. So that's why we're seeing a lot of micro four thirds users tend to be birders because it's a super lightweight setup. They can get in there super close, the image stabilization, the sharpness of the optics. It's a very mature set, very mature setup. So you know, Micro Four Thirds is also a uh, great option for this kind of stuff as well. So another thing that you want to look at is buffer performance. So, you know, how many um, photos can you take before your camera fills up? The buffer is uh, basically a temporary storage as, in your camera that basically is like a traffic cop to the memory card. And the buffer will basically say, okay, camera, send me some, send me some, send me some. And then when it gets full, it stops all the traffic. So a buffer, you want a camera that has a very large buffer because the a lot of bottlenecks with cameras tend to be the actual memory card speeds. We're seeing that change with, you know, late, the new, newer, you know, memory cards and the newer technologies um, that are using the PCI Express bus. But right now, if you're using just regular SD, you need a camera that has a large buffer. So uh, from there, weather sealing is super, super important, uh, especially if you're going to be spending time out in the weather and out in the less than ideal um, conditions. So cameras like the Olympus have amazing weather sealing. Um, Panasonic has great weather sealing. Um, there's many, a lot of the cameras, especially the higher end Canon and Nikons that do a really good job uh, with weather sealing. And finally, battery life. Uh, that This is something that is super important because you're going to be out shooting almost all day long. Um, so you need to make sure that 
you have a camera that has really good battery life. Um, like we say here, most mirrorless cameras tend to kill batteries pretty quickly. Uh, make sure you pick up a few spares if you are going out. So I'm gonna take a break right here as we look at some of your questions. I'm seeing them like flicker over here. So I'm gonna take a look at some of those questions and suggestions and then kind of get back to you guys. Um, do, do, do. Even with a 1.4 teleconverter on the Nikon 200 to 500, it's tack sharp. Thank you, Jim. Very good point. Very good point. Um, Jim Summers, it looks like we're having some conversation. That's awesome uh, to have. Pete, why is it better to shoot at higher ISO with full frame, but not the other two formats? So basically what happens is you have a larger sensor. So let's say uh, you have a space in a parking lot of one parking space and you put buckets out there to fill up with water. So that's your light gathering. So the more parking spaces that you have, the more light that you can absorb, the more water is going to absorb during that rainstorm. So it's kind of that same idea with uh, micro four thirds, let's say, you know, it's a smaller sensor. So it has less light gathering ability compared to something like a full frame or medium format sensor. Uh, so that's kind of the why behind that. So the technology is getting better. So having worked at Panasonic, you know, seeing cameras like the GH5S is doing phenomenal things with low noise, with technologies like dual native ISO, where it actually switches those circuits over. Um, so they are doing different things than the traditional norm in order to reduce the amount of noise that you see in your photos. What else do we got here? Sweet setup, Pete. Uh, thanks, Eeyore. Oh, it looks like Eeyore... Um, yeah. So yeah, less noise at higher ISO. So um, um, the chat is a little bit lag behind the live stream. Uh, so I appreciate you also being in here to answer your guys's questions. Any questions you have, please put them in there. I love the interactions that we are having guys. So let's keep rocking and rolling. So some of our top camera picks for birders, the D500, uh, probably like uh, we said here, the most popular birding camera on the market. Although a lot of uh, the Olympuses too, those are uh, those are definitely a favorite amongst birders as well. But again, these are more of our, you know, looking at the entire industry, what tend to be the most popular. A7 III is probably the most popular camera of the 2019, the whole 2019. Uh, so it has some great features for birders as well. And now that we have that native glass, it's getting to become a much more mature system. The G9, my old tried and true, up to 20 frames per second. Uh, it actually has the 4K, 6K photo mode, which means you're actually recording video and then pulling stills from that. Um, it's under a thousand bucks. Uh, it's smaller form factor. The image stabilization is awesome. I mean, I could do a whole live stream just talking about the G9. It is probably one of my all-time favorite cameras. Uh, the X-T3, uh, actually one camera, that's a, it's a camera that I'm currently looking at. So I'm currently shooting the um, Canon EOS R and the M glass or the M series cameras, but Fuji, they're, they're pulling me, they're pulling me in that direction. Uh, but the X-T3 and now the X-T4 that's coming out, um, the X-T3, the price has come down a lot since it came out. Uh, it currently also includes the free battery grip. So you have two extra batteries in there. So if you remember when I talked about the um, having the extra battery life, having that free grip where you can actually put uh, two more batteries in there, that's a huge help. And then the Beast, the Sony A9, 20 frames per second, silently, no blackout, amazing autofocus, good auto or good high ISO performance, it tends to be a really good selection as well. So what are some of the most overlooked items for birders? Uh, memory cards are probably the number one filling up uh, that memory card, especially if you're holding down that shutter button, uh, you're filling up your memory card super quick. So that's one thing, always take an extra one with you. Um, and also make sure that you know, you have an extra card just in case something happens. So especially if you're going to be out there in the in the weather, in the rain, you definitely want to make sure you have a second one. Uh, our pick is probably the rugged cards from ProMaster. Uh, super fast, so you don't have to worry about, you know, that buffer is going to clear out faster if it can write to the card faster. Um, it also no longer has the weird ribs that are on the bottom of SD cards that I've ripped off so many of them and they've gotten caught in my camera. It's been a pain. Um, it got rid of those as well. So monopods and tripods um so monopods are awesome because they're lightweight uh you can put the um monopod head directly into your longer lens um it gives you just enough stability uh, especially if you're using a camera that has um stabilization already it's going to help kind of counteract some of that um 
The monopods are probably the easiest, lightest weight. They're a lot cheaper than some of the higher end uh, tripods. Uh, it's just easier to hike with just a regular monopod. Uh, sometimes you're going to have to have a bigger tripod. So um, you can look at things that are like carbon fiber to lighten that load or, you know, the more smaller, more compact ones. Uh, you just have to make sure it will support whatever lens that you're putting it on that. So if you have questions about, hey, I have this lens, you know, will this tripod support it? Please let me know. Please, please let me know. And definitely, Jim knows what's up. Uh, spend the extra men memory money on good memory cards. And that's why we recommend the Ruggeds, because they're just going to hold up a lot better than most. Tripods are a great option for stationary um, shooting. Um, so if you know, if you're going to be a place where you're going to be kind of staying put for a long time, um, then definitely a tripod is going to be great for you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the head. So if you look on that photo um, on the right, uh, there is, that's a gimbal. So that head allows you full um, 360 access, but then it's also like a swing. So like on this area here, it swings back and forth. Uh, so that gimbal head allows you to go up and down and then all kind of in every direction. And there's several different gimbal heads uh, that are out there, but it gives you kind of the most freedom, especially as things are happening super fast. Um, you need to follow those birds, especially you can see here, we have a really long lens. Uh, so that person needs to be able to move super, super quickly in order to follow those birds. That's what that gimbal is going to allow you to do. Uh, but you can get very, you can get many different heads. You can get, um, you know, tilt heads, you can get, um, ball heads, you can get all different types of heads for the top of the tripod. And once you start to like, I did this myself, where I got a little bit more serious about photography, and I was never really much of a tripod shooter. And what I did was I had kind of these all in one tripods, I would buy a tripod that had a head on it. And that was just the it was the end of the discussion. I didn't really think anything more about it. Uh, but as I learned a little bit more about photography, I found that different heads have different purposes. It's just like every piece of photo gear. You know, you have to have the right tool for the right job. And that's where these different gimbal heads, that's where, you know, you can upgrade just your sticks or just your the legs for the tripod and keep the head or just update the head and, you know, slowly upgrade. You don't have to buy everything together. So, you know, as you kind of work up, you get a little bit more serious about birding or different uh, areas of photography. That's where making that upgrade probably makes the most sense. So, Moving right along, a few, a few tools that will make birding a little bit more comfortable. So comfort is king, especially if you're going to be out there for a long time. One of my favorite things is a black rabbit strap, black rapid strap. Sorry, caffeine's kicking in. Uh, mine's hanging actually right over here next to my uh, computer monitor. What's great is that you, it moves the center of like where you would normally hold your camera. And it puts it over to the side so you can have it just right at your hip. And then it'll also, you can just screw it into the bottom of most lenses that have that tripod feet. And it kind of balances it a little better so that lens isn't just dangling from um, the screw hole on the bottom of your camera or you don't have that big heavy strap pulling your neck down. Um, it just, again, it's much more comfortable to carry. Uh, walk stool. So a walk stool is a small... Um, a stool that can kind of go in your backpack and then once you get set up you can actually um, lower the or you can open up the legs like a tripod and it gives you a stool to sit on so it'll also allow you to like especially for things like the air show and again birding it gives you kind of a lower shooting angle so you can you know get a little bit more creative with the different views and things like that that you're looking for rain sleeve so we saw that rain sleeve here on this last slide uh the rain sleeve is great just to have in your bag they're under i think they're like 10 bucks a piece um maybe even less if they're a little more i apologize i'm not at the store right now but what they do is they can they don't take up any room in your bag and then it allows you it has like a little cinch cord at the end that you can tighten around the lens to keep the uh, weather off of your camera. Uh, camera bags. So camera bags are super important. Um, I, I feel like I can actually use this time right now to have an intervention. Uh, my name is TJ Houston and I have a bag problem. I'm surprised I don't hear my wife screaming like hooray that I've, I've finally come to this realization. Uh, but I have too many bags, but 
the bag, your camera bag is super important. So like I just went to Ireland a couple weeks ago. I spent hours researching the perfect bag for that trip because I knew I was taking my M gear, but I wanted, you know, I had this certain amount of things. Like I had a checklist. I had everything in one pile and I put it in almost every bag that I had and nothing was perfect. Nothing was comfortable. Nothing was the access that I wanted because I knew I would be doing more street shooting. Um, we'd be in and out of the car a lot. Uh, so that's when I picked up my Wandered, um, which they're having an awesome sale this week. Um, check out our website. There's a bunch of savings on the Wandered. Um, but I put everything in it. It fit perfect. And on, honestly, I took it on the trip. It's become my favorite bag. The straps are super comfortable. Um, and I'm actually getting rid of a few bags that kind of overlap features. But when it comes to birding, knowing what features you need in that bag are super important because again, you're going to be taking different lenses out. So they're going to be different sizes. Um, so you might find that having, you know, a, all open case that you can set everything in is more comfortable. Uh, when I was a wedding photographer, uh, I actually had in the back of my car, I had built this like wooden contraption with drawers and I had inside, um, separators for all my gear to go in and then whatever gear i needed i would fill up a smaller bag and go out so that's where bags are important and we have like this whole wall of bags in the store uh so if you have any questions on bags or want to try them out um please let us know uh there's a couple of we all have our own kind of favorite bags um but i feel like i probably bought the most bags out of everybody on staff because i hoard them i'm telling you i have a bag problem um any questions so far let's see what we have in the chat room uh, we have rain sleeves in four different sizes at Pixel, all under $10, and you get two per pack, I think it's supposed to say. It says you get per pack, so um, yes, so we have those in store. Uh, when using a Black Rapid, use the screw hole on the foot of the lens and not the body to connect the strap to. Exactly, so I guess I wasn't super clear on that. So what he's saying is... On the lens, on larger lenses, it has a tripod foot. And on the bottom of that tripod foot, it has a place where you can actually secure the Black Rapid strap. And that's going to displace that weight across the entire camera. It's not going to be as wonky. It's also a much sturdier way to hold it. So it's not putting all that weight, all that tension on the bottom of the camera. So thank you, Jim, very much. You've got a lot of information, Jim. I'm liking you. I appreciate you hanging out with us. And... uh putting that out there. Um, so moving on. So getting the right shot can be challenging. So let's talk about uh, some of our camera settings. Uh, there are several methods to get the right shot in the end. The key is making sure the end photo is sharp and in focus. Uh, so a lot of people don't like using manual mode. And if that's you, that's, that's okay. Uh, you can definitely jump into the sports mode that's going to give you kind of the best features of you know that kind of that moving action but really we, we want to get you into manual mode in this case uh, so i wanted to talk a little bit about using manual because it's as easy as one two three it's super easy to get set up and i want to take you kind of through uh, what settings you need to have so number one is going to be our shutter speed so we have to make a choice here we want to know what are we trying to do? Are we trying to blur the background? Are we trying to freeze action? That's I, I look at setting exposure as different decision points and trying to do it all at once, you're gonna go crazy, but if you slow it down and break it up into little chunks, it makes it super easy. So for shutter speed, you have to set it based on what type of shooting you're doing. If a bird is, if a bird is just sitting still, then you can get away with something a little bit slower. But if it's a super small bird, then you need to have a much, much faster shutter speed because they're gonna be moving around super fast and you're gonna end up getting blurry photos. And that's not what we're doing. We're trying to get tack sharp photos. So a pro tip would be keep your shutter speed faster than the focal length of your lens. If you're shooting at 600 millimeters, you should be shooting faster than 1 600 on a hundredth on a full frame camera. Or if you're on a crop sensor, micro four thirds, um, a Fuji, any of the um, crop sensor cameras, then you need to account for that 1.5 um, or 1.6 on Canon crop factor. Um, that'll also reduce your um, the camera shake that is seen as well. So it's kind of a rule of thumb, an easy way for you to set your shutter speed. Uh, for birds in flight, uh, 1 1,000th, 1 2,000th is a happy medium. Uh, for most birds, um, in this case, the faster the better. Uh, but remember, you're going to have to bump up your ISO, which we're going to talk about in a minute. You're going to have to bump that up in order to achieve that shutter speed, because that's a really, really fast shutter speed. 
Next, set your aperture. So aperture, what I've seen a lot of mistakes, um, and Eeyore as well, is people just want to open it wide. You know, they want to make sure that it's open, is, you know, wide open and letting as much light in as possible. And the problem with that is most of the lenses are not the, not the sharpest at that point. So in a lot of these longer lenses, they tend to be a little sharp at that point. So it's best to um, kind of bring it back. So especially if it's a bright, sunny day, you know, locking that in an F8, again, on a full frame camera, um, you also have a little bit better chance because of that, your depth of field to actually have more sharpness throughout. But this is something that you're going to want to experience, uh, experiment with. Um, but we recommend kind of a good rule of thumb is on a sunny day, kind of hanging out at F8 if you can. Number three is set your ISO. So I'm a big fan, as is my friend Eeyore, who helped me put this presentation together, of auto ISO. So ISO is basically how sensitive your sensor is, how sensitive it is to gathering that light that's coming through the lens. Um, almost every camera that's out now allows for auto ISO, which means you can go into your camera menu, you can set what your lowest ISO and your highest ISO and your camera will go back and forth between those. So I tend to leave that on. Um, I did the same thing for like weddings and stuff. I would lock in my settings, but then I would leave uh, my settings, meaning shutter speed and aperture, but then I would leave my ISO on auto ISO and I would let it go up and down for like the fast moving things. Now, obviously for things like stationary birds or in the wedding case, like stationary portraits, I'm going to lock in that ISO because I don't want that to fluctuate when I'm editing because that would be a pain. So if you're if you're going from bird to bird to bird, auto ISO is going to be fine. And with the noise reduction on these newest, latest, and greatest cameras, um, you can bump that ISO up super high. And there's also software out there uh, that will allow you to get rid of a lot of that noise. So exposure compensation. So exposure compensation, my world like lit up when I learned about exposure compensation. Um, it just makes life so, so much easier. Uh, your compensation is basically um, depending on the mode that you're in. So let's say you're an aperture priority and you're locking in your aperture and you're telling the camera that it can control shutter speed, ISO, it can make those changes. When you use exposure compensation to go up or down, you're telling the camera, hey, I want this photo to be just a little bit brighter or a little bit darker. So the same thing is true with birding. So let's say you jump into shutter priority and you set your shutter priority to one two thousandth of a second. You take a photo and it's a little bit dark to your tasting. What you can do is you can use exposure compensation to go through and go down a stop or up a stop. And it's going to keep your shutter speed the same, but it's going to make other changes. So uh, what I'll do a lot of times, especially if I'm shooting in manual mode, is I'll lock in my aperture and my shutter speed. And I'll just let auto ISO be my exposure comp so I can go brighter or I can go darker, it makes my life so much easier. So take some time if you don't know about exposure compensation, take some time to learn it because it can definitely save you a lot of time, um, especially for me. You know, I'll take, I'll have something in the screen and I'll be looking at it because I shoot mirrorless and I'll make it, yeah, I want that a little darker, boom, done, move on. So it just takes a lot of the guesswork, a lot of the thought process out of, um, photography and it lets you be creative because you don't have to worry about what settings you have to set in order to do that in order to get that perfect exposure. So another thing I want to talk about is metering modes. So metering modes are super important, especially when we're talking about like the exposure compensation. How is the camera figuring out what you want, what you want to focus on, what you want the exposure to be set to. And that's where the different meter the metering modes come into play. So center weight average, that's going to basically measure the entire scene, but it's if it's set to that mode, it's going to put emphasis what's on the center. So for birding, if you're always going to have your birds in the center of the frame, this is going to be fine. Uh, I tend to be the next type of shooter where I use spot metering. So spot metering, what it'll do, it'll measure uh, the center of the focus point and ignore the rest of the scene. So Basically, uh, when we when we talk about the measures, the center, that's where the focus point is. So it's not necessarily the center of the frame. It's actually where that focus point goes. So if you want to test this out, um, if you have a traditional DSLR camera, put it into live view. Um, if you have a mirrorless camera, um, it'll just do it on screen. But what you can do is you can set it to spot metering and move your focus point around and you'll see where your exposure goes up and down. So I tend to be mostly doing spot metering because I'm moving that focus point um, around a lot. 
uh, to tell the camera, this is what I want my exposure set to. And then I'll use exposure compensation to go brighter or darker. And the final is matrix metering. So what this will actually do, it'll um, kind of cut up, chop up the scene into different frames. And it'll try to balance the lightest of the light and the darkest of the darks in order to get you kind of a baseline exposure. And then in all of these, like I said earlier, you can use that exposure compensation to go brighter or darker. So let's talk a little bit about autofocus. So uh, the most important setting for autofocus is making sure it's set to continuous. You know, the birds probably aren't going to uh, just hang out forever there for you. They're going to be moving around. Their heads are going to be moving around. They're going to be going up and down branches uh, or they're going to be in flight. So you definitely want to make sure that your camera is set to um, continuous autofocus. And then the second tip is you'd probably want to turn off auto area. So auto area is where the camera just picks and chooses where it sees movement. Um, and it'll, you know, look at, you know, is there a contrast between it and the background? It's trying to do the thinking for you. And unless you're doing birds in flight and it's a completely blue background, um, that's not gonna, it's not gonna work well for you. So you definitely want to jump into one of these other areas. So, these are the different focus screens that you're going to see, kind of focus zones that you're going to see on your camera. In general, the ones that we use um, the most are tracking. So it'll actually uh, track the things that are that you lock onto. It'll actually track those back and forth. Um, and another is... Um, the expansion. So it's going to uh, be in that single point, but then it's going to expand out to the points around it as well. Um, another option is to use expanded single point. So that's going to track the subjects at the point that you determine, but it's also going to keep an eye on the stuff around it. So as that bird starts to you know, move off of that center, it's actually going to start following that as well. Um, one thing that I use a lot is just single point um, for birding, but just in general, like for my weddings and stuff, because again, I want to kind of pinpoint uh, exactly what I want to focus on. So I'll just use that single point, use my thumb to put it on what I want to focus on. And then it, the camera knows that this is the only thing that is important to me. And a little bonus for Panasonic shooters that are out there. Um, another one brands might have this as well. I just don't, I'm not as familiar with it, but on Panasonic, there's actually an option that will, it's almost like a hyper um, single point where you put it in a general area and then your screen will actually zoom so you can fine tune to make sure that that is exactly what you want to focus on. So I would use this a lot at weddings when I was trying to focus through a crowd. I would lock into the bride and groom with that super, super tiny point, And then I would kind of fine tune it after I got that zoom in. So the same thing would be for birds. So as you're shooting through that foliage, you'll be able to lock in and make sure that you can see that bird you're not focusing on just some random branch is it better to limit the amount of total focus points uh jim wants to know so uh, my style of shooting and eeyore you can chime in as well um in my style of shooting i like having that single point and i'll just make that single point larger and smaller and with that i am shooting mirrorless so i'm actually using my thumb uh, let me actually grab a camera here so i can show this on camera so let me pop this on so when I'm shooting my camera, I'm actually, my thumb's right here and I'm moving the autofocus point all around. So for me, I'm looking through here and then I'm using my thumb to move that around. So as I get a little bit closer here, you can see that this is like a super natural place that I can quickly move my focus point around. So for me, I tend to be a single point fo autofocus shooter. Um, so for me, the single just works the best. I'll just make that larger or smaller depending on kind of the area or the bird that I'm focusing on or the subject matter in that case. Um, Eeyore might have um, some other things. Oh, yep. So I'm going to read this to you guys. I'm reading over my shoulder here. Um, I find a better, a smaller amount of focus points better if I'm manually adjusting the point. It makes it faster to go from side to side, to, from one frame to the other. Um, so another kind of bonus tip for Panasonic people that are watching, um, you can turn on a feature that allows you to loop. So if you get to the edge of the screen and hit over again, it'll go to the other side. And also if you press the center of the autofocus joystick, it'll reset to center. So um, again, I apologize my infamiliarity with other brands, uh, but I talked to Panasonic for two years straight. So any Panasonic shooters out there, you get bonus tips from this guy. All right, so a couple tips on techniques that you can use. So 
so far, we know what lenses that we need. We know what other stuff that we need. We've got our camera all set up, our exposure. We understand that. But what are some tips? What are some techniques in order to get those perfect shots? So number one, you have to uh, channel your inner Elmer Fudd. So you have to be very, very quiet when you're hunting birds. Or if you're more of, I forget the Adam Sandler video that this is from. So bonus points uh, to anybody in there, uh, in the chat. Um, if they can tell me what video or what Adam Sandler movie this is from, uh, but I, I fear you're underestimating my sneakiness or this was the butler that like came out of nowhere. That's how you have to be with birds as well. So you have to be kind of, kind of quiet, especially if you're wanting to get close. Um, but if you're just starting out, just find a local you know, a local park, or if you have a bird feeder and just practice with some of the more common birds. So if you always have, you know, I mean, it can be geese at this point in Ohio. Um, that's a big target for you to focus on. Um, but if you have kind of those more common birds, just start off with that. This is a great place where you're not having to, you know, you don't have this expectation of getting these awesome bald eagle photos. And when you get there, you screw up because you didn't practice. It's best to just hang out at your bird feeder at home or invest in a bird feeder. We did that last year because... Um, I was starting to be home more with this job. Uh, so I was like, I want to start getting a little bit more into birding. And we just threw up the bird feeder. And then you're, I mean, you're basically calling in the birds for you to practice. So that's a great tip. Um, also, it's best to start off from a distance. So kind of get that, you know, from farther back, get your safety shot. Take that. Get a little bit closer. You don't have to army crawl to get there. You can, you can walk. Uh, but go ahead and get that next closer image and just kind of work your way up. I would hate for you to get super excited and get up close to that bird. And then you bring your camera up to your eye and it's gone because you spooked it. You scared it. It's best to actually spend your, spend a little bit of time and getting, you know, just work your way nice and close, slow and steady. We'll win that race. Also the final one is spend some time watching the birds. And when I worked at Panasonic, I spent a lot of time at birding events and I was really captivated by how many people were at these events without a camera. They were just there with binoculars. They were just there to watch the bird, like literally bird watching. I mean, I and I guess pardon me for, you know, not really digging deep into bird watching, but they were just there to check out the birds, see what they were doing, um, take notes and document the birds. So if you do that, you're going to get a little bit more understanding of the birds. Like the people that um, were out for the biggest week in American birding, which is a big thing here in Northern Ohio, where um, I believe it's the warblers are migrating through. Um, they know like this by the sound the bird makes. They know the color, if it's male or female. They know so much information about that. Uh, so if you want to learn more just about birding, go to some of these larger events that go on, like the biggest week, and ask questions. I mean, it's a fun hobby, uh, but when you talk to these people, you're going to understand the birds a little bit, behave their behavior a little bit better. And once you understand their behavior, you can anticipate that behavior. So you know where they're going to go next. You know what the next step is going to be. You're going to know how they act or if they make a certain sound before they take off. You're going to be able to understand exactly what the birds are doing. Uh, so Eeyore and uh, my friend over at Tech Gear Talk, great YouTube channel. Mr. Deeds is the uh, the Mr. Sneaky, so I appreciate that. I might have to binge watch that as we're on uh, our little stay-at-home order here. But yes, you have to be very sneaky, very, very sneaky. So number two would be change your angle. So when you're shooting, try to change the angle and get a different view of the bird. So we can see here, this was uh, this photo on the left. Uh, this was one of the ones that was earlier in the presentation. But you can see... We made the move in order to get a different view. So now we have a different view here on the side. We have a really, really creative one where it's just the eye of the bird where you can see um, Eeyore in the reflection of the bird coming back. So this is three totally different Im images just by him moving around or getting closer and changing his angle of view. So, you know, don't take for me like I'm a big firm believer and don't shoot the same thing twice. If you're getting the same thing, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do it. So I find a lot of um, wedding sh photographers will take the same picture of, you know, the bride and groom on the dance floor a hundred times. And it's like, well, you're not getting much, you're not getting anything different. Change your angle, put your camera up higher. Same thing goes with birds. You know, you can move your angle around. If it's up in a tree, get right under it. Uh, you can back up, try your different focal length, get creative with it and change your angle. And finally, watch the weather. Uh, one of the important things to watch out for with birding is the weather. So 
if it's kind of an overcast day, it's great because you're going to get soft light and you're going to get light from all sides. That light has no direction per se uh, because there's a big soft box known as a cloud over it. Uh, but that is going to require you to bump up your ISO a little bit. So your photos might be a little bit noisier, but that's where those software titles come in that will help you get rid of that noise. On a sunny, sunny day, though, you're going to have amazing light, especially in the morning, because the directionality of that light and the birds, it's going to illuminate them. But you have to be thinking about that. You have to think about where the sun is coming up. Okay, so all that sun's going to hit it in that direction. So you're going to want to be, you're going to want to kind of have that sun at your back so it illuminates the birds for you. But if you are, for some reason, on the other side, you're going to get backlit birds and you're not going to have detail on their feathers. They're just going to have like a rim light around them. Uh, so you have to make sure that you understand kind of where the light is coming from and, you know, take that into consideration when you're taking for pictures of birds. You don't want to just walk out there and just start snapping. Be cognizant of what the sun is doing and what the light's doing. At the end of the day, you know, we're capturing light and how the light is hitting the birds and we're using that to kind of paint our image. Visit frequently. So this is one thing that is super important because going to new places is always fun. But for birding, you know, you want to make sure that you have kind of a good base, especially when you're getting started out. And go to your local park, your local, whether it's a state park, a uh, national park, your local area, and go there very often. And sometimes just I just go and just kind of walk around and just take note of like the birds that are around us. You could buy a super cheap pair of binoculars that are, you know, the ADEX binoculars. They're about 400 millimeter uh, equivalent. And you can just kind of see what the birds are doing. You don't always have to have your camera and have that extra stress of having your camera. Just go out to and appreciate the birds and finding when you go to the, your the same place over and over again you're going to try to start to figure out what the birds are doing in that habitat you're going to find what hot spots are there and that that'll happen after just a few visits so when i was first starting out i noticed that i would go to the same place as other people on almost the same day same time of day and they would come out with awesome pictures and i didn't see one freaking bird all day and it's because they went there all the time so they know knew where the birds were they went in they got their shots they hung out they left i was like scouting and trying to find birds and it was my first and second time to these places so i was at a severe disadvantage because i didn't know where those hot spots were if you go to those, you know, if you go more frequently, you're going to understand kind of where those birds hang out and you're going to have much, much better luck. So the last tip is get creative, you know, do things like, uh, one thing I did last year was there was, um, uh, waterfall and a bird was kind of feeding, uh, right in front of it. So I knew that I wanted that cascading waterfall. So I slowed my shutter speed down and I just took a bunch of shots to make sure to get the one where the bird was not moving back and forth with that slower shutter speed. Look for birds near water. So you can see here, you know, we get a little bit of a reflection. We're getting a little bit of a story with all these birds behind it. Um, we're seeing, you know, it, the, the, the picture is telling a little bit of a story. And also, don't be afraid to crop in. I mean, you can, the, the 20, 40, 60, I mean, 187 megapixel files that we're getting out of these cameras don't be afraid to crop in, uh, especially if you're just going to be sharing them on Facebook. Uh, the photos are going to be absolutely fine. Like this photo here was actually from an um, M5. So it's actually a little bit of an older camera, um, but still crispy, still looks good. Um, and I just cropped in and, you know, because I wanted this specific look. I didn't want all the stuff that's over here on this left hand side. I didn't want all those extra cars and stuff. I wanted to focus in on this bird. And finally, practice makes perfect. So practice, be patient. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And we are a resource for you. So feel free to reach out, uh, whether it's, you know, we have the answer or we probably know somebody in the community that can get that answer for you. I'm looking at you, Jim Summers. You, you got a lot of information. You're pulling out the old woman Creek in Huron. You got, you got all this good information. So here, us just doing this live stream, we've made a connection for you. Um, Jim, he's been putting stuff in here all day. So thank you for that. Thank you, Eeyore. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, we are a community of photographers, and we all absolutely love photography. So feel free to email us at sales at thepixelconnection.com. If you want a copy of this presentation, uh, feel free to reach out on Instagram at the.pixelconnection. Just search for Pixel Connection. Uh, on Facebook, you can find us there. Just search for uh, the Pixel Connection 
and also phone is super easy. We're still, you know, we're still working. We're still here that we have a kind of skeleton crew in two different shifts, but we're still at the store. We're still working. We're still here to serve you guys and whatever we can do to help you, we will. And finally, there is that blog post on our website, go to thepixelconnection.com and you will get the information that I just shared and even more. So if there aren't any more questions, I appreciate everybody for joining. I'm going to go through, edit this video down just a little bit, and it'll be available for you to view at your pleasure. And please do us a favor and share this out. We're going to come at you every noon until this, um, every, every lunch, every day, 12 o'clock with different topics about photography. So Share it out. Tell your friends. I hope to see you guys tomorrow and the next day. And we're in this together. If you need anything, please let us know. Thanks and have a good one.